Chapter 16 The Epiphany Things had gone pretty well at the club that night as well, and the day was looking to be the best I'd had in a long time. I took a cab back to the apartment with the last bag of cocaine in my pocket, undecided as to whether I'd have any or not. I was still buzzing about shagging Sarah earlier that day. It was the right result, and I'd been reminded that there are natural highs in life, highs which didn't involve putting toxins into your body via smoking or injecting or sniffing drugs up from toilet seats. Clearly, there was an ever so slight risk of Amin finding out, but I couldn't believe she'd tell him. She loved him, in her own way, so wouldn't take the chance of telling him just to be honest or truthful. Those overrated qualities that often damaged relationships more than enhanced them. Plus, she mentioned keeping secrets, which all but guaranteed that her lips were sealed, and I knew mine were. I didn't fancy Amin or Jason finding out. I was quite happy knowing that I'd screwed the hottest woman in my life right now, and also that my cock was fully functioning, albeit a little quick off the starting block. Of course, things can change quickly in today's world, and as I climbed out of the taxi outside the apartment, I couldn't fail to notice Amin screech off in his car, driving past me with an angry look on his face. He didn't see me, and I was glad, as a look in his eyes told me that he'd just received some bad news. Not that I didn't care about Sarah, but my first concern was for me. I hoped, and even prayed a little, as I walked up the steps to the apartment that Sarah hadn't come clean about us playing hide the sausage at the nudist beach. Nervously, I entered the apartment and emptied my pockets in my bedroom before heading to the kitchen to get myself a drink. There was no sign of Sarah until I was making my way back to my room and I heard her sobbing in her bedroom. I put my bottle of beer, only my third of the evening, down on my bedside table and then made my way to Sarah's bedroom. I tapped gently on the door, had no response and then opened it slightly and peered inside, not sure as what to expect. I'd seen her upset and even angry before, but never crying. No lights were on but I could see her outline on the bed under a blanket. What's up Sarah? I asked. Are you alright? Not now James, just leave me alone please. I wanted to leave her alone. I wanted to go to my room, sip on my beer and fall asleep whilst watching a film on my laptop, but I felt obliged to show her that I was there for her. I saw Ramin leaving, I continued. Just fuck off, will you, she yelled. Give me some space, please, for fuck's sake. Okay, I said defensively. Good night. I gently closed the door and heard her inhale sharply before crying louder than her previous sobs. I retreated back to my room, relieved that I hadn't discovered that Amin was aware of what happened, or worried that it was still a possibility to be the case. And that was when the moment of weakness arrived, and I racked up my first line of coke of the evening. I washed down a cigarette with my beer and another line of powder. I needed to realise that I wasn't high. I wasn't sober, but a million miles away from the high that I should have had after a couple of hefty hits of my drug of choice. If anything, I felt a bit sad. I sat in silence, thinking a lot of Sarah and Amin and if he knew or not. And then, of course, if he knew, thinking that I'd be in the shit. And then Jason would find out, and I'd be in the shit with him as well. I'd have the occasional moment of rational thinking, realising that if Amin knew... He'd have called me and threatened me, or even waited at the apartment for me to come home. Perhaps even waited in my bedroom, sat in the dark with a knife in his hand to stab me to death, or cut off my nuts when I came home too drunk, high and feeble to defend myself. But then what was the problem? Maybe they'd just reached breaking point in their relationship, and to that the beach was just a coincidence. Although, regardless of her recent infidelity, she loved the mean. It was clear as day to see and no one could deny it. Not even Jason who I now knew had feelings of Sarah stronger than he had ever let on. I knew I had to stop being paranoid, but then again, what a situation to be in. I didn't want to be caught up in this mess, and for the first time in months, I thought about going home. I looked at the wardrobe where my bag was stored and thought, what if I just packed up my things and went? It was at that moment I felt something running down onto my lip from my nose, and almost in autopilot, I took some tissue from the drawer and wiped the snot from my face. I knew this time it wasn't snot, it was another nosebleed but the blood was pissing out, more than ever before. I found myself in the bathroom, stood over the sink, with tissue shoved up my damaged nostril and pinching my nose in an attempt to stem the bleeding. I looked up into the mirror. I looked ridiculous. The bleeding seemed to have stopped, but my face was a mess, and also, glancing down at the reflection of my skinny body, I noticed how weak and feeble I'd become. I became incredibly self-conscious in the space of seconds. Any minute amount of hide that the coke had given me was well and truly gone and I had a sick, awful feeling in my stomach. Late nights or no sleep, weight loss, shady Moroccan drug dealers, crazy flatmates and occasional impotence. What the fuck am I doing? And there it was, the moment of clarity, 
the epiphany that I'd done my best to avoid without realising it, the jolt I'd needed to realise I needed to make an effort for change. I didn't recognise that man in the mirror, and I didn't like who I saw. I went to my bedroom and picked up the coke, went to the window and ripped apart the plastic bag, letting the devil's dandruff fall freely into the dark of the night. It wasn't quite the second natural high of the day that I was experiencing at that moment, more a sense of relief that was almost as good, but certainly more important. If I forgot the money that I was enjoying spending on expensive clothes and food and alcohol, what did I have in my life? Fuck all. I'd lost track of everything. Somehow, somewhere, I was living a dream that wasn't mine. I didn't give a toss about money. Not like that anyway. I wanted success more than anything, but I guess I misunderstood what success really was. And what about the drugs? I thought I was at Marbella to get away from all that, but I all too easily fell back into that lifestyle, without any real hesitation. I saw that I'd left Hertfordshire because I wasn't happy with how my life was going, but it was now clear that I'd simply brought my problems with me, instead of facing them head on and working through them. I could stop going to the pub, maybe go to the gym instead, eventually I'd meet another girl, maybe have a kid or two. What the fuck was I doing hanging out in pretentious clubs, selling drugs, being friends with a psychopath, with both of us infatuated with some bird who clearly has issues, as she couldn't tear herself away from a man who obviously doesn't want to commit. I looked around the small room where I'd been hiding for the last few months, my bedroom, with absolutely no personal touches added to it. There were no photos on display, my clothes were hidden behind wardrobe doors. This could be anyone's room, but it wasn't mine. I pulled down the window blind, laid myself down on the bed and switched off the lamp. Complete darkness. This isn't my home. These aren't my friends. It's time to go, I said. Chapter 17. Another new start. I stirred in my bed, my phone vibrating on a table next to me, disturbing my slumber. I opened my eyes and immediately remembered my final thoughts the night before. Finally, things were going to change. I was ready. I knew what I wanted, and psychologically, I was preparing myself for another big change in my life. It meant a return to everything and everyone I knew and loved, but I would walk a different path with goals I'd worked to achieve, and hopes and dreams that kept me moving forward, not dwelling on the mistakes and pain of the past. My phone stopped vibrating as I reached out to pick it up, then I heard what sounded like a cushion being thrown at the wall behind me. It was a morning wake-up call from Jason, although I couldn't remember asking for one. I rolled out of bed and knocked on the wall. Be there in a minute, I called, and then headed to the bathroom to empty my bladder, brush my teeth and wash my face. Then I inspected my nose. There was no visible damage. I walked into Jason's room, nervous at the thought of telling him that I wanted no more involvement in the coke business, or cocaine at all come to mention it. He was under the covers, tired and grumpy looking. What is it? I asked. There's the money, he said, nodding towards the bedside table as normal. You got to meet your mean in about an hour. You called him already? I asked, knowing that this made things more awkward. Yeah, you know me, Mr. Efficient. Shit. My head dropped, chin making contact with my chest my eyes weighing down on my eyelids. I could feel his gaze on me, and from somewhere, I plucked up the courage to break the news. Please don't be a cock about this, I begged him silently. I want out, Jace, I said. I don't want to do this anymore. He looked perplexed and sat up on his elbows, turning towards me and giving me his undivided attention. Are you fucking serious, he said. Did you sleep all right? I thought sincerity was the best option. You can't bullshit a bullshitter, and Jason was certainly one of them. Yeah, I'm serious, Jace. I'm falling apart, mate. Look at me. Skin and bones. Fucking nosebleeds, I explained. Well, stop sniffing so much fucking powder then. Jace, if it's there, I'm going to sniff it, I admitted. It's become a bit of a habit now and you know it. He adjusted himself in his bed, curling up and head back down on his pillow. I'm too tired to argue, James, he said. James, I thought. That's the first time he'd call me that without trying to be funny. We'll talk about this later, all right? He continued. But I've ordered the gear now, so unless you want to call a mean to cancel, you go and meet him. And I wouldn't want to fuck him about like that. He was in a shitty mood already, for some fucking reason. Shit. I'd forgotten about a mean, and what he knew, or might have known, and the anger I'd seen in his face last night. Cancelling a drug order was a faux pas, or the equivalent in Spanish, and I didn't want to be the one to do it. So reluctantly, I resigned myself to the fact that I was just going to have to be disciplined with regards to the coke, as we'd made a commitment and breaking it would mean more hassle than it was worth. Fine, I said, but this is the last time, Jace. After this batch is gone, I don't want to be involved anymore. It's over. We'll see, I heard him mutter to himself. 
I collected the money and left the room, closed the door and leant against the door frame, reassuring myself that I was in a better place in my head and that this was the final time I'd have to do something like this. I was on the home straight, soon to be heading home with clear ideas about who I want to be and how I wanted to live my life. I wasn't to go home rich like I thought I wanted, but successful in another way, in discovering what I truly wanted and valued, which were my family and friends, but also importantly, sobriety and a positive direction in my life. Self-discipline, James. It all starts with self-discipline. I left the apartment pretty sharpish after a quick shower. I didn't want Jason changing his mind about wanting to argue my decision. I thought about popping my head around Sarah's door and seeing how she was doing, but didn't want to risk her shouting at me either, especially with the angry Australian there. I strolled along the promenade, went to a nice little bar and had a traditional English breakfast with an orange juice and a small pot of tea. With a full belly, which for me was about the size of a large grape, I sat in the sunshine, occasionally glancing at my watch until it was time to make a move. It was the moment that would make or break my day. Either Amin knew that I'd shagged his girlfriend and he'd beat me down, or worse, maybe put me in the boot of his car and get a gang of his mates to torture me and rape me and kill me slowly. Or he didn't know, and he'd just be the bullying prick that he'd always been, and I'd take his lip for the sake of an easy life, but content in the fact that soon these people in this situation would just be in my memories, which I'd try my hardest to forget. I stood in the car park, in my usual spot, nerves building no matter how hard I tried to convince myself that things were going to be okay. And then his cart arrived, and as it drew closer, I saw that it was full of his comrades. My stomach sank. He pulled up a couple of metres away from me, and for the first time at one of our meets, Amin reached down to his side, opened the door and got out of the car. Oh shit. He stepped towards me, and I noticed that he didn't look 100%, like he hadn't slept well. I almost thought that he had been crying but that didn't sound like the Amin I thought I knew. He reached into his pocket and I half expected a knife to be pulled out and pinned into my chest or throat and I froze. But it wasn't a knife he pulled out. It was a cigarette carton, as usual with the Charlie inside, which he gave to me and then asked me for the money as he lit a cigarette that he took from behind his ear. I gave him the cash without saying a word. He was upset and I could see it. Something had changed. I wondered if he could sense a change in me in my awkward behaviour in front of him or perhaps that my nervousness in his company up until that point had been a good thing, as it may have seemed to him that this was just me, Nervous Jim, the English junkie. I put the trumpet in my pocket, nodded and thanked him before turning and making a move away. Wait, he said. I turned around, consciously keeping a safe distance between us. Jimmy, he said, pronouncing my name with bitterness on his tongue. How long are you stayed in Marbella? I guess he meant how long had I been there, not fully understanding his English. A few months, I answered. Maybe four months. Why is that? Why did he ask? I really didn't know. I don't think he really knew either. He just wanted to look at me, I think. He was looking deep into my eyes. Not in a sexual I fancy you way, but as if he was trying to read my mind. Trying to understand me, maybe. Considering this was still a drug deal, it was strange to feel relief when a police car pulled into the car park and Amin made his way back to his motor, then pulled away, giving me a nod and disappearing with his band of not-so-merry men. I wasn't sure, but I think I'd just passed some sort of test with Amin. I couldn't relax just yet though, as the policemen had parked their car and were getting out of the vehicle. I was getting closer to them as I walked towards the exit and could feel the cocaine bulging in my pocket. It was as I got level with the car that my heart skipped a beat. I saw one of the policemen had a dog with him. The Alsatian was taking a shit between the police car and another vehicle and both the policemen stared at me as I passed. Is that a fucking sniffer dog, I thought. Thank fuck he's otherwise engaged. They didn't stop me, or say a word. One of the coppers even gave me a tip of his cap, and I guess that they'd stopped to let the dog do his business. Maybe they felt awkward as I'd caught them letting it shit in a public place. Not that I cared. That was the last time I'd be in that car park. The coppers could have pulled down their pants and left their own number twos if they wanted to. I nodded back to them and smiled, feeling more relaxed with every step I took away from them. Perhaps the dog knew what was in my pocket, but was too busy doing what needed to be done. Nobody's perfect. As I got out of view, I took to trotting briskly along the road until I was a couple of blocks away and I felt my phone go off in my pocket. It was Sarah. Hey you, I said. How are you doing today? I'm fine, James, she answered, sounding a lot better than the last time I'd heard her voice. So, what are you up to, I asked, acting like the carefree friend I assumed she wanted me to continue being. I'm at the bar. One of the girls called up sick and I couldn't get any cover, she said. Actually, are you busy? It's just that I wanted to talk to you. Yeah, talk, I said, 
thoughts running through my head as to what the subject of conversation could be. No worries. Um, I'm already pretty close. I'll be with you in a bit. Okay. I'll treat you to a beer, she said. No, not for me, thanks, I told her. My body's a temple, don't you know? See you in a bit, James, she replied. Chapter 18. Favours called in. I sat down, placing coasters, hanging them over the edge of the table and flicking them up and trying to catch them. After a few goes I got it sussed and started flipping four then five then six coasters at a time. Sarah approached from behind and placed two coffees on the table before sitting beside me. You know, there were some kids in here earlier playing that same game she said, dryly. Sorry. I pulled my coffee close and ripped open two packets of sugar at once, tipped them in and stirred. She did the same. So, I said, what did you want to talk about? That same dreadful feeling about Amin came over me again, even though I was 99% sure I was in the clear for now, but unless Sarah wanted to talk dirty in my ear and arrange for another session of secret sex, I had no idea what she wanted to say. Things weren't awkward between us, there was no need to clear the air or anything like that. Obviously, no one knows about our day at the beach, James, she said, keeping her voice low, understandably. But... Amin and I are having a few problems at the moment, she continued, and I'm worried that he might start taking it out on you and Jason. I nodded my head, as if to understand what she was getting at, and I'm not sure why, because I didn't. For me, if Amin didn't know that I shagged his bird, then there's no reason for him to take anything out on me, unless he was uncomfortable with the fact that me and Jason were two horny young men who lived under Sarah's roof, which was more understandable, except he could have acted on that any time over the last few months. But then... He was acting strange in the car park that night before. It's funny you should say that, I said. He was acting a bit weird a minute ago. So what's the crack? She blew the surface of her coffee, took a sip and placed it back onto the table. For the first time since I'd met Sarah, she couldn't look me in the eye as she spoke. I think it's the end of the road for us. He doesn't want me anymore, she said. She was upset, and that was what I expected as I heard the news, as I knew that although Amin was an arrogant bastard who didn't treat Sarah as well as most men would have, She was a gorgeous, attentive woman. She loved him, in her own way, even adored him. But it wasn't just hurt that I saw in her eyes as they looked out of the door of her bar and towards the sea that glistened under the sun. It was anger, and it was definitely anger that had made her clench her fists under the table too. That was another first that I'd witnessed in Sarah that day, a negative energy she was carrying. She was trying her best to hide it beneath her calm, warm and friendly exterior, and I wondered then how much of Sarah I really knew. She moved a hand across to mine, squeezed it in hers, then looked across at me and forced a smile. I can trust you, can't I, James, she said. I decided that it wasn't the right time to tell her that the night before I'd committed to the idea of packing my things and leaving all this madness behind with the hope of never seeing any of them ever again. You know you can, I said, realising I must have learned something from those lying bastards at the telemarketing office. Amina's got my money, she said, and I need it back. What money? I asked, surprised. My money, she continued. About 20,000. Clearly there was more to the couple's relationship than I imagined. Were they in business together? Did they have projects other than a bar on selling drugs? He looks after it for me, she said. This was another surprise, because this implied that it wasn't a business, legit or otherwise, that they were in it together, but that she had that sort of cash available for herself, so I really must have missed something. I know she had the bar and the apartment, but other than that, it turns out I didn't know much about Sarah at all. She told me it was kept in a sports bag in a wardrobe in his apartment and asked me to get it for her. She said Jason would go with me, but I wasn't too keen to get involved at that point. Have you actually just asked him to give it back, I asked, hoping their little diplomacy would stop me having to make quite possibly another wrong decision in my life. You don't really know him, James, she stated correctly. We're finished and he thinks he owes me nothing. He won't give it back to me. Sarah was again avoiding my gaze, cleaning her nails or staring out to the sea. She went silent at this point, which is a sales technique, leave the conversation hanging, the weaker person being the first to break the silence and almost always being dominated for the rest of the negotiation. Of course, I was the weakest link. Okay, so how, I asked. Do we just knock on the door and ask for it? I'm not sure he's going to take much notice of me or Jason, especially Jason. I have a key, she said. Go with Jason Let yourselves in and get the bag. My bag. I sighed and she heard. I knew that she knew I didn't want to do it and she knew that I knew that she wasn't impressed by my reluctance to get involved. Then why can't you just go round when he isn't home, I asked, 
rather fairly in my opinion. I can't go back there, she said. The last time I was there he threatened me and pushed me around. Well, it's all coming out of the woodwork now, I thought, so it doesn't seem the sort to let herself get pushed about. And then, as if to prove my point, she turned to me and gave a stern look. I did you a big favour letting you stay with us, James, remember? She said, not so much asking as reminding. You owe me. Not one to be bullied. I didn't cave in as quickly as she might have liked. I sipped the last of my coffee and took my turn at staring out to sea. When? I asked, cool as a cucumber. Tomorrow, she said. He goes to the gym most mornings, so it's probably best to do it then. And Jason is fine with this, I asked, for some reason, maybe to delay any firm commitment on my part, as I was 100% sure Jason would have done this with his hands tied behind his back and blindfolded if she'd asked him to. Of course, he'd do anything for me, she confirmed, and I did catch the inflection in her voice as she said it, which I found childish, and not encouraging nor convincing, as I imagine she mistakenly expected. I don't know, Sarah, I said. I've got so much going on in my head at the minute. Just let me have a think about it. I patted her hand gently then stood. She grabbed my arm and gave a last desperate plea for help. If you do this, James, I'll owe you forever. Thanks for the coffee, I said, and left. Chapter 19. Decisions Made Back in the cyber cafe, I took the piece of paper I'd just printed from the guy behind the counter, checked it all looked okay and smiled happily. Gracias, I said as I looked up to the owner and smiled, but he just wanted paying for the use of his internet and printer and held out his hand for some cash. He telefono, por favor, I continued, pointing towards my usual booth. I sat down and misdialed due to the excitement of the news I was about to break. I dialed again, and then my sister answered her phone. Hello? Right, sis, it's me. Hey, James, long time no speak, she said, the joy in her voice. How are you doing? Are things okay? Yep, I'm fine, cheers, I said. Listen, Esther, I'm just letting you know that I'm coming home. Really? When? Tomorrow, I continued. I just booked my flight. Tomorrow, she said, with disbelief in her voice, making me wonder if she'd written me off. Mum will be so pleased to see you, she continued. And Finley, too. You know he doesn't stop talking about you. Bless him. So, I guess this is you fishing for a lift home from the airport? No, no, I'm not actually, I explained. In fact, you won't see me for a couple of weeks yet. I'm going back to rehab. Suddenly, her tone changed. I thought you were already off that poison, she said, still in her voice. My weekly phone calls to mum had even convinced Esther that I was sorting my life out. I was glad that I wouldn't have to lie anymore, especially to those that loved me like only my family did. Es, I know, I reassured her, and I'm off it, I'm off it all, but I think a couple of weeks in rehab will do me the world of good. I'm thinking longer term, do you know what I mean? It didn't help before, she said, quite rightly, but I'm ready for it now, I replied. These fucking drugs. I'm ready to move on. There was a moment of silence. That sales technique, where the first to break the silence was the weaker, ran through my mind. If I spoke first, she would think I sounded desperate, maybe even pleading for her to believe me. If she piped up first, then I'd take it as a sign that she trusted me, that she had faith that I was finally controlling or at least trying to take control of my life. You know, that's the first time I've believed you when you've said that, she said. I wanted to say, I love you, Esther and I'm doing this for you and Finley and Mum as much as I'm doing this for myself. But I settled with, it's the first time I've meant it. I'll see you soon. Jason was on his bed, eyes closed, screwing up his face as the vibrating phone beside him gradually woke him from his slumber. He picked up the phone and squinted to see Sarah's name on the screen before answering. Hey beautiful, he said. Finally, where the fuck are you been? came the voice from the other end of the phone line. Jason listened as Sarah updated him on her morning meeting with that bastard James and informed him that the skinny cokehead didn't want to help out with retrieving the money. Jason didn't seem too concerned about it, but Sarah was adamant that if Amin was there when the collection was made or came home during, then two bodies would be better than one. Jason wondered if she really was concerned for his safety or that she didn't trust him to do it alone, either messing things up or taking off with the cash. Jeez, all right, said Jason the high-pitched noises of a distressed woman stabbing at his eardrums, forcing him to interrupt. I'll sort it out. He just needs a little convincing, that's all. Leave it to me. He ended the call and rolled over on his bed, trying to find that wonderful comfort that one always has when waking up, but sometimes struggles to find when trying to get to sleep in the first place. How the fuck am I going to get that little English prick to grow up here and do as he's fucking told, he thought to himself, probably in an Australian accent. Later, Jason woke up, this time naturally, 
with no phone vibrating against the wood of his bedside table, and now sat on top of that same table, with the weighing scales and a bag full of smaller bags of cocaine inside. I was in my bedroom packing my suitcase, when I heard Jason stomp down the hallway and try to open my door. It was locked from the inside. Hang on a second mate, I said, I'm getting dressed. I closed up the case and put it back in the wardrobe, looked at my reflection in the mirror and nodded at myself, happy with the decision that I'd made. I had butterflies in my tummy, excited about going home maybe, but also enjoying the added excitement of doing things secretly. I didn't want to hear the bullshit from Jason about leaving him without a business partner, or any more of this stealing back the stolen money from Mameen. I didn't want a part of any of it, but I knew that the easiest way out was just to sneak off without saying a word. Some might call it a coward's way out, but I didn't care. The important thing was that after one more night selling powder, I was a free man, in body, mind and spirit, and I loved the feeling. It was another natural high, nearly as good as sex, which I'd promised myself to make an extra special effort to be involved with again in the very near future. I opened the door to let Jason in, but he remained outside, stood in his work clothes. I wondered if he was going to lecture me about not agreeing to help Sarah, or nag me about wanting to get out of the coke game, but he didn't. Right, Jimbo, he asked. I'm off in a minute, mate. You got some coke or you need me to leave you some? I'm fine, mate, I replied. You keep hold of it. All right, yeah, cool, he said. There was a moment when we caught each other's gaze, and for those two or three seconds, which felt like a lifetime, I swear I could hear the cogs of his brain turning, thinking up something. What, I didn't know, but I did know, or at least I thought I knew. This was the first time that Jason hadn't just came out and said to me whatever it was that he was thinking. He had a couple of reasons to be unhappy with me at this moment, with the coke and Sarah, but I guess the fact we had more coke to sell that night meant he had to keep our working relationship intact, for the time being anyway. It was an awkward moment, horrible really, and so another moment that confirmed to me that I shouldn't be there. In that sense it was good, but still uncomfortable. See you in a couple of hours, he said, before turning and walking away. I sat down on my bed, in near silence, and listened as he went to the kitchen, grabbed some water and food to take with him, and then opened the front door and leave. Then I stayed motionless in my room for a few minutes more, making sure he really had left, or didn't change his mind and come back in for an argument. Then I stood, pulled out my suitcase one more time and finished packing my things. Everything packed away, the suitcase went back into the empty wardrobe, and the door closed. I was happy, until I felt familiar sensation on the top of my lip. I headed to the bathroom to fix my bleeding nose. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Thank you.